Hello, friends. Welcome back to Sorry What. Jason here to bring you the second part of our story. I'm leaking part 1 so if you missed that, go watch it before this one so you don't get lost. Drinks ready. Now get comfortable and here we go. Kakila woke to find herself in the hospital. For a moment, she could not remember what had happened to her, before it all came back to her in a rush. Gran was in town and had been for weeks, although he had made no effort to see either her or Danny. That thought was like a physical pain that racked her body. I have to see Grant, she thought. I have to explain that my fling with Randy meant nothing, that it did not affect our marriage. Kat started crying, the tears running down the side of her face as she stared up at the ceiling. She was still crying when Danny opened the door to her room. She sat up to receive a hug from her son. Mom? Are you okay? Oh Danny. Your father is in town. The police think that he's the one that attacked Randy. Why do they think it was dad? The police said he's been here three weeks. Kat cried out. That's not good. What's your plan, mom? I just need to talk to your father and explain things to him. Your father loves us and our life together. He's not going to throw that away. Don't worry baby. I'll fix this. Kat and Danny were talking about Grant and remembering some of the fun experiences they had as a family when there was a knock at Kat's door and detectives Man and Lucas entered the hospital room. Just checking in with you Mrs. Keel. You're looking much better than the last time we spoke. I guess I am feeling better after sleeping away the last two days in a hospital bed. Have you seen my husband? Is Grant going to come visit me? Her tone was begging for good news of which they had none to offer. We spoke with him this morning. I don't think you should get your hopes up about a visit. I have to talk to him. I have to explain that things are not as bad as he may think. He has to understand that what I had going on with Randy meant nothing. Detective Man looked seriously pissed while Detective Lucas looked at Cat with sympathy. Both detectives had marriages and due to cheating. In Detective Man's case, his wife had cheated on him with an old high school boyfriend and had left the detective a note saying that she was done with being married to a cop. Detective Lucas's marriage had also ended due to infidelity, but in her case, she had cheated on her college professor husband with a fellow police officer. They had tried to reconcile, but Detective Lucas had not been able to stay faithful and had again cheated on him with the same co-worker, resulting in her husband filing for divorce. The irony was, she truly loved her husband and was devastated when he filed for divorce. She blamed no one but herself and sought therapy for herself to find the root cause of her destructive behavior. After three years, she was still seeing her therapist every week. She had not been on a date since being served. She empathized with Kat and could only recommend therapy. Mrs. Keel, do you know how your husband found out about your affair? I imagine someone told him. No ma'am. He says he had the state championship game playing on a big screen in the JAG office. His whole staff was working that day and was watching the game with him. After the game ended, you threw yourself into the arms of Coach Kane, wrapped your legs around him, and started kissing him. His whole office watched that live. Kat looked at the detective with a horrified look as she shook her head. No. No, that couldn't have happened like that. I would remember doing something like that. That didn't happen. No. You're lying. Mom, Danny said. It did happen. Everyone saw it. And I was standing right there as dad watched us so he knows that I knew about you cheating on him. Detective Lucas watched as the realization began to dawn in Kat's eyes that her marriage was likely over. At that moment, there was a knock on Kat's door, and a pudgy, middle-aged man carrying a large envelope entered Kat's room, and after nodding hello at Danny and the two detectives, asked if she was Catherine Keel. Sorry to do this here ma'am, he said apologetically as he handed Kat an envelope. You've been served, the stranger said, then turned and left without saying another word. Kat handed the envelope to Danny and with a haunted, fearful look in her eyes, asked Danny to open the envelope and tell her what it was. Danny opened the sealed envelope by running his index finger under the flap, and then extracting the contents which he held up for Kat to see petition for divorce. Detective Lucas ran into the hall looking for a nurse, as Danny frantically pushed the nurse call button, while Kat started hyperventilating and making a keening noise, as she rocked back and forth in her hospital bed. Let me show you around, Grant said to Lynn Dunaway as they entered the door into the empty office space. So, you're buying the whole building? She asked as she looked around the interior, poking her head into each individual office. I think I'm going to go for it. The space had been an attorney's office for years until he became too old to practice law and had put the building up for sale. There was room for three attorneys, several paralegals, a couple of legal secretaries, and a receptionist. There was both a large and a small conference room, male and female restrooms, and a kitchenette. Lynn was suitably impressed. Wait until you see the second floor, Grant said with a grin. Grant Keel was very happy to see Lynn Dunaway. 
In the months since he had discovered his wife's adultery, they had spoken by phone at least three times a week, and she had provided invaluable support to him. During their time working together in Korea, Grant had never seen her as anything other than Captain Dunaway. He knew that the blonde-haired, green-eyed Lynn Dunaway was objectively very pretty, something that she downplayed while in uniform, but standing in the empty offices of the building he was contemplating purchasing, Grant could see how gorgeous she was. They took the stairs to the second floor which led to a small foyer that held two doors facing each other. Grant unlocked both doors and stood aside for Lynn to enter one, and as she walked into the room he heard her gasp. The entire second floor of the building was comprised of two apartments. A 3,000 square foot apartment and a 1,500 square foot apartment. Both apartments had been completely renovated a few years ago, and contained modern bath and kitchen fixtures, as well as 15 foot high plaster ceilings with intricate moldings. But what it caused Lynn's gasp was the view of Lake Ray Ferguson from almost every room in the apartment. Unlike many towns that renovated their downtown squares by adding shops and restaurants, Ferguson never needed to do that. The city's town square was located one block from the lake which shared its name with the town's founder. Shops and restaurants had always occupied storefronts along the city square, and when the Army Corporation of Engineers built the lake as part of Roosevelt's WPA, a town center that had always been a thriving and bustling area, became even more so with the lake mere feet away. The building that Grant was contemplating purchasing sat on a street corner of the square, with the front of the building facing the town square, one side facing the avenue leading to the lake, and the rear of the building, facing the lake and the boardwalk containing even more shops and restaurants. They entered the second, smaller apartment, and Lynn was suitably impressed. It had been upgraded at the same time as the larger apartment, and had the same lake use. Can you afford this? Lynn asked in a concerned tone. I have my half of the inheritance from when my folks passed a few years ago. That money was invested in my fidelity account, and those funds were never commingled with our marital assets. They should be exempt from my divorce settlement. There's more than enough in that account to pay cash for the building. Are you ready to be a landlord? Grant shrugged at her question. In addition to the law offices and the huge apartments that comprised the entire second floor of the building, also operating on the ground floor of the building was a diner that was open for breakfast and lunch, a Lily Pulitzer boutique, and an Irish pub that served excellent food, in addition to having a house band playing Irish and Celtic folk music Wednesday night through Saturday night. I am so jealous of you, Lynn smiled. You seem to have struck gold at the worst time of your life. Well, actually, I have an ulterior motive for asking you here. How would you like to become partners in a new law firm? Lynn gave to Grant in surprised shock. Seriously? You want me to resign my commission and move to Ferguson? That's I don't even know what to say about that. Think about this you would have the second apartment rent free. We would be Keel and Dunaway, attorneys at law. I'm not expecting an answer now, but think about it Lynn. Lynn wandered through the second apartment again, looking around, especially at the lake view. At 1500 square feet, Grant knew the apartment was the same size as the house she was currently renting in Killeen, Texas outside Fort Cavazos. As he watched Lynn run her hands along the stone countertops in the kitchen while looking at the lake, he observed that she had a thoughtful look on her face. What do you mean their insurance company told you to go pound sand? Randy Kane mumbled to his attorney. He wanted to shout, but it was too painful to do so. Even the act of whispering was excruciating. Randy had most of the wires from his jaw removed two days previously, after being wired shut for nearly eight weeks. There were still several pins and screws holding his jaw together, and the popping and clicking coming from his jaw hinge was driving him insane. Any food or liquid that was either too hot or too cold caused his entire head to throb with pain. The casts had been removed from his knees and his elbows, but he still had pins and screws at each joint, and they would stay there for the remainder of his life, such was the trauma from his attack. Randy's insurance was about to reach the policy limit on live-in care, and he was months, possibly years away from being able to live on his own. Even going to the restroom required assistance, and would continue to require assistance for several more months. They're denying any liability. You were attacked on a public street and not on the Keel's property. No one has been charged in the attack, and the investigation is still ongoing. If one of the members of the household is convicted in the attack on you, then we can go after them, since there is a $1 million umbrella policy, as part of the Keel's homeowner's policy. But that's only if someone from their home is convicted. Todd Blair had gone to high school with Randy Kane, and at that time thought him a real asshole. Time had not changed his opinion of Kane. Knowing that he was in this situation because he was sleeping with someone's wife, reinforced Todd's low opinion of Kane. What's going on with the police investigation? Every time I call Manor Lucas they blow me off. That is when they even bother to return my calls, Randy mumbled bitterly. Todd rubbed his temples as he stared at the speakerphone. 
He was hoping the detectives would speak to Randy, but they appeared to be in no hurry to give him the news. Todd sighed. The investigation is over. I met with Detectives Mann and Lucas yesterday. And, Randy said eagerly. And you're not gonna like this, Todd said. Detectives Mann and Lucas had completed their investigation, and the meeting with the district attorney had not gone well. What you're telling me is that you're pretty sure Grant Keel carried out the assault. No, said Mann. We know he did it. But you can't prove it, asked the DA. Mann and Lucas had looked at each other, unhappy with the direction the conversation was taking. It also sounds like it could also possibly be the brother, the DA observed. The detectives reluctantly agreed. Hell, it sounds like it could also be the brother's wife, the DA checked the file for the name and said, Betty Lou. Or maybe even Betty Lou's brother Bobby Lee Gearson. The two detectives nodded glumly. You two know that the purpose of the criminal investigation is to narrow down the list of suspects, not keep adding to it. You all do any more investigating and you'll put half of Ferguson on your suspect list. The detectives looked morosely at each other, and then back at the DA who shook his head. I'm sorry detectives, if that's the best you've got, then it's a no. There's no way I'm bringing charges or going to trial with this dog of a case. A first year law student could get the charges dismissed. Come back when you have something. Man and Don returned to the Ferguson police station, and dejectedly reported to the assistant police chief the results of their meeting with the county district attorney. The APC prioritized for them a new case, filing the Randy Kane assault under open and unsolved. Kat didn't fight the divorce. Her attorney advised her that it would be a waste of time. Her affair was so public and disrespectful to her husband that no judge would insist on counseling. Her best option was to agree to the divorce and over time, work on mending her relationship with her husband, and repair the damage she had done to her son, by making him keep her affair away from his father. Grant had been fair in the divorce. Kat got to keep the house, and Grant finished paying off the mortgage. Additionally, Kat would be eligible for a portion of his military pension. The formula that would be used was based on the fact that we're married for 20 of the 25 years of Grant's military career, so she would receive less than half. Grant wanted a couple of pieces of furniture from the house, but little else other than some tools and his clothes. Finally, the time came for a conversation. Grant had not been looking forward to this, but he knew that Cat needed it, and he was willing to grant this last gesture. They met in a conference room at his attorney's office. Grant, I know what you think of me, and however harshly those feelings are or however much I disgust you, please know this, I am more disgusted and appalled by my behavior than you will ever know. I have no excuse and can say nothing to mitigate my actions. I hope one day you can forgive me, and you will be able to be in the same room with me. Grant looked at his now ex-wife. Cat, I love you. Hell, I still love you, despite all that you've done. But I am learning to love you a little less every day. I hear what you are saying about how you feel, but that's just a word salad as far as I'm concerned. I don't wish you harm, but I don't wish you well. I want you out of my life to the extent possible. I know we'll have to interact because we share a son, and there will be events in which we will both be involved, but given a choice, I would prefer to never see or speak to you again for the rest of my life." Kat broke down crying at Grant's words. She understood his anger and his pain, but she had one final request of her soon-to-be ex-husband. Grant, please do one final thing for me now that our marriage is over. Please see Danny. He misses his father. It kills me that the two of you have not seen each other since you've been back. Please, see your son and talk to him. Grant had nodded his head as he turned and left his attorney's conference room. There has to be something I can do. Randy whined plaintively. I can't coach and I can't teach. I can barely wipe my own ass. I'm almost broke and my insurance is running out. What am I supposed to do? Odd Simpson, Todd said. What the duck are you talking about, Randy said. You remember when the jury acquitted Odge of killing his wife and that other guy Goldman? Yeah, so? Goldman's family sued Odge for damages. Civil suits don't have the same burden of proof as criminal courts, and the family won millions. Odge didn't have the money, but they took what he did have, and in the court of public opinion, everyone now knows that Odge is guilty. You're saying I should sue Grant Keel? I don't know it's an option for you, I guess. Up to you. You take the case. Todd Blair quickly shook his head no. He wanted nothing further to do with this asshole. I'm booked up, but I can refer you to someone. This is probably more in line for his skill set anyway. It was a subdued gathering in Grant's apartment after his divorce. His brother Leland, Leland's wife Betty Lou, Betty Lou's brother Bobby Lee Gearson, Lynn Dunaway, and Grant were chatting in the living room of Grant's apartment above his law office, when the doorbell rang at the downstairs entry. Grant opened the camera app, noted the identity of his visitor, buzzed open the door, and walked to the door of his apartment to await his visitor, who knocked a minute later. 
Grant took in the sight of his son standing in the entry and pulled him in for a hug before pushing him back at arm's length while grasping his son's shoulders. You look good, son, Grant said. You too, dad, Danny replied. Danny followed his father into the living room and smiled a greeting to his aunt and uncle and his uncle by marriage. He had not met Lynn, but he knew who she was. They all looked to Danny in silence. A baseball bat. Really. I thought the plan was to rough him up a little. Betty Lee said. Danny looked at Lynn, who said, I've known everything since Korea. As soon as you sent your dad the text telling about the affair, I knew about it 10 minutes later. As soon as he knew that his mother was cheating on his father, Danny had sent his dad a text. He had kept his father in the loop the whole time. They deleted their text for deniability while at the same time, hoping that they would never need that deniability. The plan was to simply leave active duty and divorce Kat, but things had changed. Kane was beginning to pressure Danny about not going to West Point, and the level of disrespect Kane was showing Grant's family skyrocketed. After Kane had stood naked in front of Danny in his own house after coming from Kat's bed and then assaulting Danny in his own home, Danny wanted revenge. Some people will quote the ancient proverb that if you begin a journey of revenge, first dig two graves. Grant thought that was absolute horseshit. He much preferred Francis Bacon's comment that revenge is a kind of wild justice, even though he knew that Bacon was not advocating for vengeance, but rather the opposite. Still, Grant felt that there was a cathartic healing power in visiting great violence upon those who had greatly wronged you. He would not deny his son his own wild justice. To that end, Grant had agreed to Danny's plan to end his mother's affair, while also not destroying his relationship with his mother. It had long been decided that Danny would stay away from his dad and family until the divorce was finalized and the police investigation was over. Danny shrugged apologetically. It just all came boiling out. Every smirk he gave me. Every comment about mom being a great piece of ass. Every comment about being my stepfather. I admit, I wanted to kill him at that moment. It was all I could do to stop pounding on him. I knew that I couldn't take him one-on-one. -on -one. That leg sweep he threw at me showed me how fast and how strong he was. I couldn't take him down that way, but Danny trailed off as he thought about bringing the bat down on Coach Kane's back. He was not happy attacking from behind, but the much bigger man would have killed him otherwise. When I collected my bicycle, you were cool as a cucumber. When I read about how badly you racked up the piece of sheep, I thought, oh yeah, he's a keel all right. Operates just like his dad and uncle. Betty Lou looked at Lynn who was sipping a glass of wine and listening to the conversation with amusement. Are you sure you want to associate with this family? Lynn had smiled and taken a sip of her wine. Later, after his visitors were gone, Grant sat on the sofa next to Lynn, their shoulders and thighs touching. Well partner, she began, I'm glad that this is over. Now maybe we can concentrate on growing our practice and other things. She smiled at Grant who smiled back. As long as Grant was married, he refused to act on the feelings he had for Lynn. Now that the divorce was final, he could get out of limbo and allow his feelings to grow for the person who had stood by him for so long. The following morning, Grant was in his office reviewing a will that a client was having him draft, when the exterior door buzzed, indicating someone had entered the law offices of Keel and Dunaway. Lynn came out of her office to join Grant in the reception area. They did not yet have a receptionist. Can we help you? Lynn asked of the portly, middle-aged man. I'm looking for Grant Keel, the man replied. That's me, Grant said, stepping forward with his hand out to shake. Instead, the man handed Grant an envelope. You've been served, the man said with an apologetic shrug before turning and exiting the office. Roland Cruz contemplated the wreck of a man sitting across from him. He was very aware of the assault on the former head coach of the Ferguson Wildcats. In the wake of the assault, Kane had been fired from the Ferguson School District due to his flagrant affair with a married school teacher, his employment had also been terminated. Cruz knew that he had a reputation as a bottom feeder. When Raleigh walked into a courtroom with a client, most judges automatically attributed some level of guilt to his client before the trial even began. So, you're banging this guy's wife, her son knows all about it, and is cool with it. Really? Randy nodded his head. I know it sounds crazy, but Danny Keel and I had a really good relationship. You say had like it's in the past. You two don't have a good relationship now. He hasn't called or visited me since I was attacked, Randy said bitterly. Nothing. And I was like a father to that boy. Raleigh Cruz shook his head at the whole idiocy of a steaming pile of dog sheep of a case that Randy Kane had brought to him a few weeks ago. It had been nearly six months since the attack, and Randy was desperate for money, and suing Grant Keel was his only option. The police investigation had gone nowhere. They were sure that Grant Keel was the person who attacked Randy Kane, but they could not prove it, and Keel's family had muddied the water so badly that no jury would ever convict him. 
There wasn't even any circumstantial evidence tying Grant Keel to the assault, much less hard evidence. The bat that had been used had never been located, and the whole circle jerk the family engaged in with the black hoodies on the day in question, was not proof of anything other than they were a sly bunch of assholes. So, Raleigh was left trying to figure out what the duck was going on. He had requested, and received copies of every bit of evidence the police had, and was in the process of reviewing it all, and trying to determine what the hell happened. By all accounts, Catherine Cat Keel had been a loyal, loving wife for 20 years. Her family had been posted to various military installations around the United States and Europe, and in all that time, there was no hint of an affair or impropriety. When her husband was sent to Korea, something changed. Since Korea was considered a hardship tour, his family could only accompany him if he signed on for two years, otherwise, it was a 12-month tour. This meant that Danny would not be able to play football his senior year. After much discussion, it was decided that the Keels would purchase a home in Grant's hometown of Ferguson, and Danny would attend Ferguson High School, while Kat tried to find a job as a science teacher, a position she had held at various postings during her marriage. Shortly after her husband left for Korea, Kat had fallen for the handsome twice-divorced and 10 years younger football coach. She had been carrying on an affair with Kane for months, and her son was aware of the affair. Hell, the whole school suspected something was going on. Grant Keel became aware of the affair and relocated to Ferguson after leaving active duty. He had not told either his wife or his son that he had relocated and moved in with his brother. Grant Keel, his brother, and his sister-in-law had avoided Cat Keel and their son during this time. As Rolly reviewed all the evidence and watched all the recordings, an idea had begun to form in his mind. Leland, Betty Lou, Bobby Lee, Lynn, and Grant were once again meeting, this time joined by Danny. All but Lynn had been served notice that they were being sued as part of a conspiracy to assault Randall Kane Jr., said assault rendering him unable to work and depriving Mr. Kane of his livelihood. The plaintiff was seeking $10 million in real and punitive damages. How bad is this going to get? Bobby Lee Gearson asked. Grant had shrugged at the question. The jury in a civil suit doesn't require nearly the burden of proof as the jury in a criminal court. In a criminal court, the prosecutor has to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. In a civil suit, the plaintiff only has to prove it could have happened. Listen, I'm not going to hang y'all out to dry. This is my issue. Mine and Danny's. I'll meet with Kane and his attorney and agree to a settlement if the suit against you three is dropped. Bullsheep, Betty Lou snapped. We're family, we stick together. Lynn is going to defend us, and she is going to kick some ass. Agreed. Leland and Bobby Lee immediately agreed. Bobby Lee wasn't related by blood, but he had known Grant and Leland since grade school. When his best friend, Leland married his sister, Betty Lou, it had been one of the happiest days of his life. Then it's decided. Leland asked. We tell this Roland Cruz guy to go duck himself. Everyone agreed. During opening statements, Raleigh Cruz explained to the jury his strategy. He was going to prove to them that a conspiracy existed among Grant Keel's friends and family to attack, and then subsequently cover up the assault on Randy King. He further explained that although the police were unable to prove to any degree of certainty which one of the conspirators had attacked Randy, they all had conspired in the act, and should all be held accountable. Lynn's statement was simple. The police did not have sufficient evidence to charge anyone, and Randy Kane's lawsuit was a desperate attempt to shake down the family of the man whom he had severely wronged, by having an affair with the man's wife. Cruz's first witnesses were predictable. He called to the stand the EMTs and the various physicians who had treated Kane to detail the extent of the damages that Kane had suffered in the attack. There was very little room for cross-examination because Kane's injuries were what they were. They were not self-inflicted, although going down that road had been briefly debated, it was ultimately decided that convincing the jury that Kane had repeatedly struck himself in the face and testicles with a baseball bat was going to be a hard sell, but instead had been inflicted by someone with a personal grudge against Kane. Cruz next called the law enforcement officers that had responded to Katz 911 call. The responding officers verified that the crime scene was as represented by Cruz in his opening statement. Cruz next called Catherine Keel to the stand. Kat verified that she had been having a sexual affair with Randy Kane, and that the affair had been going on for several months. She stated that Kane had told her that he was in love with her and wanted her to divorce her husband to be with him. She denied that she was in love with Kane, although she admitted that she had become very fond of him. She was aware that Kane had made some inappropriate comments to Danny, but she understood from Randy that it was locker room talk, and that Danny was not perturbed by the comments. She was also aware that Randy had walked naked through her house after having sex with her, and had made no attempt to cover up in front of Danny. Finally, she admitted that she knew that Randy had a minor confrontation with her son, and Randy had to be slightly forceful with Danny to calm him down. 
She also admitted that she was under the impression that her husband was in Korea at the time of the attack upon Randy, and was unaware of her infidelity. When she was advised that Grant had been in Ferguson for several weeks and was aware of her affair, she had a mental health crisis that required hospitalization and her being placed on suicide watch. Lynn's cross-examination decimated Kat. Mrs. Keel, why did you undertake to have an adulterous affair with the plaintiff, Randy Kane? Objection. Cruz shouted. The term adulterous affair is prejudicial to my client, your honor. Maybe so, Mr. Cruz, but it is a factual term, and I'll allow it, the judge stated. Mrs. Keel, please answer the question, Lynn said. I didn't have a good reason. My husband is a great guy. He's smart, handsome, and athletic, and he was very much in love with me. But I was weak, vain, and insecure. At the time, I was approaching my 42nd birthday. My son was going to be out of the home soon and off to college. My husband was stationed thousands of miles away and I was lonely. Coach Kane is a good-looking, sweet talker. All the female students and teachers had a crush on him, and I was flattered this 10 years younger hunk started hitting on me. He knew just what to say to me to get through my defenses. I fell for it hook, line, and sinker. Kat had to pause to collect herself. Lynn brought her a box of tissues from the defendant's table, and waited for Kat to nod her head that she was ready. I've learned a lot over the last few months. I now know how to protect myself against sexual predators like Randy Kane, Kat stated. Objection, Cruz shouted as he shot to his feet. Mr. Kane is not on trial today, and the witness's characterization of him as a sexual predator is false and inflammatory. I move that it be stricken from the record, and the witness admonished not to use statements like that. The judge looked at Kane for a moment before addressing Cruz's objection. Whether the term is false is a question for another day. I will agree however that the term is inflammatory. The counselor, I feel kind of ridiculous for even having to point this out, but Mrs. Keel is your witness. You called her, not the defendants. The objection is sustained. Flushing with embarrassment, Cruz angrily took his seat next to Kane. Mrs. Keel, Lynn began, in your opinion, is it possible that any of the defendants attacked coach Randy Kane? Cad looked at the table at which her husband, son, and the other three defendants were seated. She shook her head adamantly. No, I refuse to accept that they were so angry that they would act in a manner completely foreign to how I know them to be. Tears began to stream down Kat's face. If they were so angry that they would attack Randy like that, then I know they are lost to me forever. Kat brought her hands to her face as she sobbed piteously on the stand. The next witness was the chief investigating detective of the assault on Randy Kane. Could you please tell the jury your name, employer, and job title, Roland Cruz said to the man after he was sworn in. My name is Kenneth Mann and I'm a detective with the Ferguson City Police Department. Thank you, detective. How long have you been employed by the Ferguson Police Department? 22 years. 15 as a patrolman and the last 7 as a detective. Detective, can you relate to the jury the events of the morning in question? My partner, Detective Brenda Lucas, and I were in the middle of investigating a claim of a stolen car when our dispatcher directed us to an address in which an alleged assault had taken place. We arrived at 1212 Conway Lane and discovered a male who had been badly beaten. He was being attended to by the owner of the house, Catherine Keel. The EMTs had not yet arrived on the scene, but we were advised that they were en route. Detective Mann, in your professional opinion, what could cause the type of injuries that you saw on Mr. King? The club. Something like a baseball bat or maybe an axe handle. Roland next had Mann walk the jury through his investigation, starting with his interview with Cat Keel. So, Mrs. Keel was not aware her husband was in Ferguson. No, she was not. She thought that her husband was still in Korea. It was a couple of days later, after I attempted to contact him in Korea, that I learned that he was back home in Ferguson. Did you think it unusual that he was in Ferguson, but had failed to make contact with his wife and son? You could say that, Detective Mann replied dryly. It raised red flags. You interviewed Mr. Keel at his brother's house, did you not? I did. Was Mr. Keel aware of his wife's affair? He stated that he was aware. How did Mr. Keel find out about his wife's affair? Cruz asked. He stated that while watching the high school championship game he witnessed his wife kiss Coach Kane. He stated that from the video he was watching, he knew that his son was aware of his wife's affair. Detective Mann, did Mr. Keel explicitly state that was when he discovered his wife's affair? Mann thought for a minute before replying. No, no, he didn't now that you mention it. He avoided lying by avoiding the question, and I didn't catch him at it. Man looked embarrassed by the admission. Rowley next entered into evidence the recordings from Leland and Betty Lou Keel's home security system, before walking the jury through the recordings. Detective Mann, as a police professional, what is your opinion about the recordings? 
On the surface, they appear normal enough. One way to look at them is that they're just everyday activities, repeated each day with minor variations. The other way to look at them is that the keels are very clever. They're trying to create doubt and muddle any sort of investigation that might look closely at their activities. Did you ask them about that? Cruz asked. I did. Several times. And each time, they said the same thing, the video speaks for itself. Next Roland introduced the recording taken by the doorbell camera of Bobby Lee Gearson. In your professional opinion, what is the import of this video? Cruz asked. Same thing as the Keels video. On the surface, all above board and honest, but full of misdirection ending with Mr. Gearson covering up the only camera with a view of the Keels house. Did you find this suspicious? Man snorted a sardonic laugh. I found everything those four, five now with the sun, have done to be suspicious. And when you asked Mr. Gearson about this, what did he say? I did ask him. He was operating from the Keels playbook. He said, the video speaks for itself. The final video introduced was the recording that Danny had sent to his relatives letting them know when the pep rally was going to take place. What was your opinion of that video, detective? I felt sorry for the kid. He's reaching out to his relatives and they've all cut him off because he knew about his mother's affair with his coach and didn't say anything about it to anyone. When did Danny Keel text that video to his family? Cruz asked. One week before the attack on Coach King. Did you notice what Danny Keel was wearing in the video? A black hoodie and dark jeans. It seems that everyone in his family owns a black hoodie, man observed, dryly as the jury chuckled at the witness's statement. As part of your investigation, did you verify that Danny Keel had attended the pep rally on the day that Coach King was attacked? I did verify that fact. How did you verify it? Cruz asked. I asked the high school principal, he verified that Danny was there the whole time and assisted him since he, the principal, had to take over Coach King's role in his absence. You could also have verified that Danny was there by going to the website of the Ferguson newspaper, Roland said as he handed Mann a copy of the newspaper. On the front page was a large photo of the football team at the pep rally. Danny was standing next to the high school principal. Detective Mann, can you describe what Danny Keel is wearing in that photo? The jury could see Mann's eye bulge out, and his mouth drop open as he sat stunned, staring at the newspaper. He's wearing a black hoodie and dark jeans. Just like everyone else in his family that day. Did you verify the activities of Danny Keel in the time leading up to the pep rally? Detective Mann shook his head. No, we knew he was at school and had no reason to think that he might have left the campus. The detective paused and glared at the defendant's table. That's on me, I knew his dad was turkey, I should have figured that the apple didn't fall far from that tree. Lynn objected, and the judge ruled Mann's statement stricken from the record, but it was a bell that could not be unrung. Detective Mann, going back to the video that Danny sent to his relatives, could it have been confirmation of a plan that had previously been agreed upon? A plan in which Danny told his relatives what to wear on that specific day and to have alibis. Could you have been looking for the wrong person all along? Objection, Lynn roared, but it was too late. The jury had turned its collective eyes on Danny. How did he figure it out? Danny asked. The group was meeting in the law offices of Keel and Dunaway that same evening. The remains of several pizzas were growing cold as they discussed the day's testimony. It appears that Roland Cruz Esquire is a lot sharper than people give him credit for, Lynn answered. He figured out that all the actions of your dad, uncle, Betty Lou, and Bobby Lee were a smokescreen to allow you to go after King. Maybe you guys were too smart for your own good. He either hasn't figured out that Betty Lou dropped a bicycle off a block away from the school, or he can't prove it, so he's not touching it. What's our next step? Betty Lou asked. I make a settlement offer with King, Grant said. No. Everyone said in unison. We stand together, Betty Lou said as Danny, Leland, and Bobby Lee nodded assent. How badly did today hurt us? Danny asked Lynn. It left a mark, no doubt about that. The cat actually helped us out more than she did King. The sexual predator comment was gold. Lynn looked at Grant a bit side-eyed. How did you feel about her testimony? Grant shrugged. I'm glad she was able to get the sexual predator comment in, but as far as how did her testimony affect me overall, it didn't. She'll always be in my life as Danny's mother, but that's it. He grabbed Lynn's left hand and brought it to his lips as he smiled at his law partner. Tomorrow Kane will testify, and then I'm sure that Cruz will rest the plaintiff's case. We should get through our witness list pretty quickly, so the trial will probably wrap up tomorrow afternoon. For better or worse, we should have a verdict by the day after tomorrow. The group sat in subdued silence as they contemplated the end of the trial and the possible verdict. As expected, the first witness called the next morning was Randy Kane, the former head coach of the Ferguson Wildcats football team. 
After being sworn in, Rolly Cruz began his questioning. Coach Kane he began which caused an immediate reaction at the defendant's table. Objection, Lynn stated. Mr. Kane is not presently employed as a coach. I would remind Mr. Cruz that Mr. Kane's employment was terminated because of his affair with a married teacher. The judge thought for a minute before shaking his head. Counselor, I'm overruling your objection. Mr. Kane has in the past been a coach. I used to coach my son's little league team years ago. When I run into any of his teammates, I am still referred to as Coach Bowman. At this time, I'll allow the plaintiff the use of the honorific of coach. As Cruz turned to gloat at the defense counsel, he was momentarily taken aback by Lynn Dunaway's amused expression. To continue Coach Kane, can you describe to the court your relationship with Catherine Keel? Kane managed a sad expression. I loved her. I didn't want to fall in love with a married woman, but sometimes your heart leads you to places that you shouldn't go. I know it was wrong, and I am deeply sorry to her husband for my part in the affair. Randy paused to look at Grant with what he thought was a sincere apologetic look. I was wrong, but that doesn't justify what they did to me. Kane angrily pointed at the defense table as he shouted. Cruz patted the air with both hands as if to calm Kane down. Were your feelings reciprocated by Mrs. Keel? Yes, or at least I thought they were. She would tell me that she loved me, but any time I would suggest she divorce her husband to marry me, she would shut me down. We would talk about her husband while we were, you know after sex, but if she thought I was putting him down or something she would get mad at me. She wouldn't allow me to say anything bad about him which I thought was ridiculous. I mean, we have sex for two hours, and I know she was having fun because she'd be completely ring out, but the minute that I would say something about it being better than sex with her husband, she would get all up in my face. Kane shook his head and looked sadly at Kat who was seated in the back of the courtroom. The only thing I did wrong was fall in love with the wrong person, and then try to do the right thing. Kane had a sad and forlorn look on his face as he turned to the jury. Cruz glanced at the jury and was not convinced that they were sympathetic to his client, but from experience, he knew juries were notoriously difficult to gauge. How was your relationship with her son Danny? Cruz asked. Great, said Kane. It was his first year at Ferguson High, and it was my first year as head coach. Danny came in with a lot of raw talent, and I think I was able to harness that potential and turn him into one of the best high school quarterbacks in the state. Maybe the entire country. We had a very close player-coach relationship, and I thought he considered me as almost a stepfather. I see now that I was wrong about that. If Danny's the one that assaulted me, I guess I never really knew him. At that point, Cruz rested his case, and Lynn Dunaway began her questioning. Mr. Kane, what is your definition of a man? Cruz immediately objected asking the relevance of the question. At the judge's question, Lynn explained that it would soon become clear. The judge allowed the question but told Lynn she was on a short leash. My definition of a man is someone who his teammates can always depend on to have their back and be there for them. Someone who always gives 110%. Someone who lives his life in a way so that he can hold his head up and be proud that he did his best for himself and his team. Mr. Kane, this is so important to you that you even have this sign over the locker room exit, correct? Lynn handed a photo to Kane in which a sign read, play like men today. Yes, Kane said, beginning to have an uncomfortable feeling about where the questioning was going. When the players leave the locker room, they touch the sign on their way out, don't they? They do. Mr. Kane, would you say that any part of that very eloquent description of what it means to be a man was in any way represented in your relationship with Danny Keel? Kane glared at Lynn as he sat in silence after she asked her question. Judge, could you please direct the witness to answer my question? Before the judge could speak, Randy barked out, no. Is that what you wanted to hear? No, my actions were not in line with how a man should act. But I made the mistake of falling in love with a woman who I thought loved me back. A married woman, Lynn emphasized. Yes, a married woman, Kane said, his bitterness obvious. Mr. Kane, tell us about the time you beat up Danny Keel. The change in direction momentarily confused Kane. What? I never beat Danny up. You mean the time that I thought he was mad and was going to attack me? That was just a minor dust-up, there was no assault. Thank you for putting that on the record Mr. Kane. You have made much of your mentorship of Danny and turning him into the quarterback he is now. Did you receive coaching offers from colleges and universities after Ferguson won the state title? Yes, I received several offers, Kane replied. Because of the assault, they've all been rescinded. Really, Mr. Kane. Because of the assault. Lynn walked to the defendant's table and grabbed some papers, bringing them to the witness stand and handing them to Kane. Are these copies of your offer letters? She asked. After looking over the letters for a minute, Kane agreed that they were his offer letters from several colleges. 
Mr. Kane, each one of these offer letters seems to be contingent upon you being able to recruit Danny Keel. Is that accurate? Kane's face burned with embarrassment. How did this witch get copies of the letters, he wondered. Yes, that's accurate, he snapped. Danny was intent on going to West Point, just like his father. He had in fact, been recommended by his congressman and had been approved. You kept insisting that Cat Keel try to discourage him from attending there, and instead go with you to a college where you would be hired. Isn't that correct? Yes, but I knew that it was better for him, too. If he played for a D1 school, that would get him into the NFL and let him make millions. He would be set for life. And if you followed him into the NFL as a coach, you'd be set for life as well, wouldn't you? It seems that your reputation as a coach was only as strong as your relationship with Danny Keel, wasn't it? Kane again glared at Lynn as she turned to the judge and said, I have no more questions for this witness, your honor. Upon returning from lunch, it was time for Lynn to call her first witness, Danny Keel. After being sworn in, Danny took his seat on the witness stand. Danny, when did you first become aware of your mother's affair with Randy Kane? I don't remember the exact date, but it was pretty soon after it began. Like within a day or two. And what did you do after finding out? I FaceTimed my dad to let him know what was going on. There was a loud gasp from the spectator section, as Kat realized that her son's loyalty to his father, outweighed his loyalty to his cheating mother. What was your dad's reaction? He didn't believe me at first. After that, he was in shock for a bit. Then he went stone cold and said he would get back to me after thinking about some things. We spoke a few days later and he told me to follow Mr. Kane's and mom's lead for a while. So that's what I did. When my mother realized that I knew, she told me to keep quiet about it, and it would blow over after a while, but if I told dad, he would divorce her and destroy our family. While asking questions, Lynn had sidled over so that she was next to the jurors, and could see that they were sympathetic to Danny. Danny, your mother mentioned a minor confrontation, which in his testimony Mr. Kane, referred to as a dust-up. Can you describe for the jury that incident? I was sitting at the breakfast nook in the kitchen. My mother and Mr. Kane either didn't know or didn't care that I was home. Mr. Kane came out of my mother's bedroom naked. It was obvious that he had just had sex with my mother. Mr. Kane was smirking at me and making some rude comments about how great sex with my mother was, and what a great piece of ass she was. I stood up and took a step towards him, and he did a leg sweep, knocking my feet out from under me. I hit the kitchen floor so hard it knocked the breath out of me, and when my head hit the stone floor, I almost blacked out. He then made a couple of comments about her being prime kitty before going back into the bedroom. Once again there were gasps and sobs from the spectator section, as Kat realized her role in the horrific disrespect shown to her family by Randy Kane. Raleigh Cruz could only look on in horror as any sympathy for Randy Kane among the members of the jury had long since fled. Danny much has been made of a video you made asking your family members to come to your pep rally. The plaintiffs have indicated that you, a high school student, were the ringleader of some sort of grand conspiracy to assault Mr. Kane, and then cover it up. I guess they think you came up with this plan during homeroom or maybe in the school cafeteria. Lynn waited for the laughter to die down, and she again noticed several of the jury members looking fondly at Danny. Can you tell us about this video? Lynn asked as the video played on the courtroom monitor. Danny looked earnestly at the jury. I know you've heard this a lot during this trial, but the video really does speak for itself. With that, Lynn had no more questions for Danny, and turned the questioning over to Raleigh Cruz, who only had one question for Danny. Danny, do you know who attacked Randy Kane in the street outside your house? Danny glanced at his father before looking at Raleigh Cruz, and then replied, Yes, I do. Raleigh was momentarily speechless at the admission before gathering his wits and asking, Who attacked Randy Kane? I did. I beat the hell out of him for attacking me earlier, and for having an affair with my mother. The gasp was again heard from the spectators as Kat cried out, No Danny. The judge banged his gavel to admonish and quiet the spectators in the courtroom. Crew smiled triumphantly before mockingly bowing his head towards Lynn. No more questions for this witness. As Danny left the witness box, Lynn called as her next witness, Grant Keel. After walking Grant through the previous testimony, Lynn asked him for his thoughts about the video of Kane's assault, taken by the Keel's doorbell camera. The video speaks for itself, Grant replied, to chuckles from the jury. Do you know who assaulted Randy Kane outside your residence? Lynn asked. Yes, I do. It was me, Grant said. I beat the hell out of him for attacking Danny and for having an affair with my wife. Objection. Roared Raleigh Cruz from the plaintiff's table. Your Honor, Danny Keel has already admitted to the assault. The defendants are just trying to confuse the jury. Mr. Cruz, you're the one who set the precedent for asking that question to witnesses. Your objection is overruled. Cruz only had one question for Grant. 
is lying, you or your son. Grant shrugged. Saying neither one of us is equivalent to saying both of us, wouldn't you say, counselor? Cruz blinked slowly in confusion at the answer. As he tried to unravel the mental knot that Grant Keel had tied him in, several members of the jury chuckled. Lynn dismissed Grant from the witness stand and called the next witness, Leland Keel. Questioning for Keel followed the same pattern as Grant's questioning. After verifying the accuracy of the recording and stating, the recording speaks for itself, Lynn asked Leland the big question. Do you know who assaulted Randy Kane outside of your brother's residence? Rolly Cruz shook his head in barely concealed rage. He already knew the answer to Lynn Dunaway's question. Yes, I do. It was me, Leland said. I beat the hell out of him for attacking Danny and having an affair with my brother's wife. Rolly looked at the jurors, most of whom were trying to conceal smiles and laughter. He looked at his client and shook his head. Dismissing Leland, Lynn called Betty Lukeel to the stand. Bubby Lou's testimony ended with yes, I do. It was me. I beat the hell out of him for attacking Danny and having an affair with my brother-in-law's wife. Bubby Lee Pearson's testimony ended in much the same manner. Yes, I do. It was me. I beat the hell out of him for attacking Danny and having an affair with my sister's brother-in-law's wife. Roland Cruz's impotent rage was evident in his closing remarks to the jury as he pointed toward the defendants. I don't have to prove my case, they proved it for me. One or more of the defendants brutally attacked Randy King. After the attack, one or more of the defendants acting in concert conspired to cover up the crime and engaged in a criminal conspiracy to do so. You ladies and gentlemen of the jury know what the truth is. Please do your duty and fine for Randy King. Lynn's closing remark was equally brief. The only thing that the plaintiffs have proved is that Randy King is a despicable human being who has affairs with married women and then beats up their children. If there was proof of guilt, they would have been arrested. Please find in favor of the defendants. Thank you. With that, Judge Bowman banged the gavel dismissing the jury to deliberate. The Ferguson Five as they had dubbed themselves in the wake of Randy Kane's lawsuit, were eating pizza in Grant's apartment while the jury deliberated. They felt that they had done the best they could under the circumstances. No one had lied under oath or to the police, although admittedly they had not been very forthcoming with the facts. Even the fact of their individual admissions to attacking Kane was true in a manner of speaking. They were in fact guilty, even if it was guilt after the fact. How long do you think it will take the jury? asked Bobby Lee Gerson. I don't think it's going to take too long for them to decide on the guilty or innocent aspect. We admitted guilt. Deciding how much to award the asshole will take up most of the jury's time. Could be today, could be tomorrow. Grant took a bite of his pizza and stared morosely at the floor. He regretted letting the others talk him out of making a settlement offer to King. If he had, this would all be over by now. How's your mother doing? Betty Lou asked Danny. Danny shrugged his shoulders, before hunching over with his elbows on his knees. She's not doing well at all. She comes home from school, goes straight to her bedroom, and spends the night crying. We've had a couple of talks about her affair and the divorce, and she is still having a hard time accepting the divorce. When I asked her how she thought things were going to end when dad found out, she started crying so badly I had to give her space until she calmed down. From what she says, she expected dad to be pissed at her, but that he would get over it and fix things because that's what he always did, when something went wrong, dad would fix it. She's only just now starting to get it, that there's no fixing this, and that she's solely responsible for her situation. She pissed into the fan and couldn't understand how she got so wet. She ducked around and found out, Leland said flatly to Betty Lou's eye roll. Thank you Mr. Reddit, Betty Lou snarked. I almost feel sorry for her. I've been her friend since you two started dating. I was right here, 20 minutes away from your house. If she was getting tempted or if she was having feelings for another man, she could have reached out, and I would have dropped everything to be with her. Any of us would have. Instead, she isolated herself from the ones who cared about her the most so she could carry on with that useless jerk-off. As they nodded their heads in contemplation of the stupidity of people in general and cheaters in particular, Lynn's cell phone dinged. Judge Bowman's clerk, she said. The verdict is in. The Ferguson Five and their attorney rose as Judge Bowman entered the courtroom. After taking their seats, the judge verified with the jury foreman that the jury had reached a verdict and that the verdict was unanimous. The foreman handed the jury's findings to the bailiff who handed the findings to Judge Bowman. As the Five plus Lynn stood to have the verdict read, Grant closed his eyes, regretting once again that he had not stepped up to make a settlement offer to Randy King. In the matter of Randy Kane versus Grant Keel, Daniel Keel, Leland Keel, Betty Lou Keel, and Bobby Lee Gerson, we find that a conspiracy did exist to attack Randy Kane for having an extramarital relationship with Catherine Keel, and for Randy Kane's abuse of Daniel Keel. As Judge Bowman paused, Grant deflated somewhat. 
The verdict had been expected, but to hear it read in court was humbling. We further find that the plaintiff, Randy Kane, should receive from the defendants Grant Keel, Daniel Keel, Leland Keel, Betty Lou Keel, and Bobby Lee Gearson, a total of $1,000 for real and compensatory damages, and a total of $100 for punitive damages. Judge Bowman peered over his glasses at the jury, who looked at him with self-satisfied smirks. He then turned to the plaintiff's table and looked at Randy Kane. Kane's face was purple with rage as he stood at the table and began hurling insults at the jury and the judge. You let them get away with this. You stupid mothertickers. Do you call this justice? Kane shrieked as Raleigh Cruz attempted in vain to calm him down and take his seat. Is there any reason for me to pull the jury? Bowman asked. The jury foreman grinned at the judge and shook his head. Bowman sighed and turned to the defendants. You have 90 days to appeal the verdict, however, something tells me that you are going to take this verdict and run with it. The six people gathered around the defendant's table were laughing and smiling as they hugged each other, as Judge Bowman dismissed the jury and banged his gavel ending the trial. Unnoticed, Kat stood in for a moment, lit proudly at her former family before exiting the courtroom alone, her tears leaving tracks down her cheeks. There would, of course, be no appeal of the verdict. The group took it for the win it was, and Grand gladly wrote out a check for $1,100. The check was payable to the court, who would pay the funds to Raleigh Cruz, so there would be no need for any further interaction with the former coach, who quickly left the area after Cruz wrote him a check for $707, the amount of the jury award minus Raleigh's 30%. Cruz was disappointed but resigned to accepting the sheep hand he had been dealt. Such was the nature of contingency cases. Grant and Lynn soon went back to the full-time practice of law. The nature of their relationship had turned sexual after Grant's divorce, and so Lynn spent more time in Grant's apartment than she did her own. As their relationship deepened, they debated what to do with Lynn's apartment. There was also the question of children. Lynn wanted at least one and preferably two, however, Grant was reluctant. At 46, he felt that he was too old to be a father. Lynn explained to Grant that he was an idiot. So, at the age of 47, Grant Keel became a father once again. Danny was able to visit shortly after the birth of his half-brother. He was thriving at West Point and enjoying the engineering courses, however, like his father, he had a strong interest in the law, and could see himself one day as a JAG attorney. Grant and Lynn were not the only new parents in the Keel family. Leland and Betty Lou had decided to adopt. Betty Lou had known all her life that she would be unable to have a child, but she had always hesitated about adopting. When the 16-year-old niece of a co-worker of Betty became pregnant from her high school boyfriend, Leland and Betty Lou had discussed the situation for hours before finally deciding that this was something they wanted to pursue. Neither of the child's parents were drug users or drinkers, they were just two horny kids that found themselves in a tough situation. Leland and Betty Lou welcomed their new daughter, Leanne Keel, eight months after the birth of Grant and Lynn's son, White Keel. It was a crisp autumn morning in Ferguson when Bobby Lee Gearson called in on Grant and asked if they could go for coffee at the cafe next door. A puzzled Grant agreed, and shrugging his shoulders at Lynn, followed his longtime friend out the door. Do you know why I got divorced? Bobby Lee asked as soon as they were seated. I know it was for irreconcilable differences, but I never asked about specifics. It wasn't any of my business. Bobby Lee had met and married his wife, while Grant and Kat were living in Fayville, North Carolina. They had flown home to Ferguson for the wedding where they had met Bobby Lee's bride, and found her to be a pretty and vivacious woman, who seemed to be deeply in love with Bobby Lee. After Grant's posting in North Carolina, the Keels were sent to Germany for three years for Grant's next posting. It was two years into this posting that they received word that Bobby Lee was getting a divorce. We cheated on each other. I cheated on her first at a bachelor party in Vegas which I confessed to, and then she had a revenge affair on me. At that point, we realized that our marriage was so broken, that no amount of counseling would fix it. Besides, she didn't want to fix it anyway. She'd fallen in love with a co-worker and just wanted out of the marriage. That was 10 years ago and I've been pretty sour on marriage ever since. Grant knew that to be true. Bobby Lee was one of the nicest, kindest men he knew and was a decent looking guy as well. He received a good salary from the fire department, and had several patents, the royalties of which gave him a very nice supplement to his income. But Bobby Lee seldom dated. His family had been after him to put a profile on dating sites or do anything where he might meet a future partner. He had adamantly refused. Okay, so where are we going with this conversation Bobby Lee? I've been seeing Kat, he said. Bobby Lee was looking at the table and fidgeting with his coffee stir as he dropped his bombshell on Grant. Seriously? You're dating my ex-wife? Grant didn't know what emotion he should be feeling now. Shock. Sure. Anger. Maybe. We've been out to coffee a couple of times and lunch one time. Nothing's happened yet and nothing will happen without your okay. 
we're on the same page in that regard. She's also been seeing a therapist every week to help her understand what caused her to nuke her marriage. I saw a therapist for several years after my divorce to understand why I blew up my life. You both cheated on your partners, so I guess you have that in common, Grant said with an edge to his voice. Bubby Lee nodded, seemingly unaffected by Grant's tone. Cheating on my wife was the worst thing I have ever done to someone. The feeling of being cheated on by someone I love was almost as bad, but I would take that feeling over the one that I got when I cheated. Grant, you know Kat better than any of us, do you think she'll ever cheat again? Grant clocked his head to the side as he contemplated Bobby Lee's question. I don't know, man. I never thought she'd cheat in the first place, so, I guess I don't know her as well as you think I do. I hope she's learned her lesson. I hope she'll never cheat again, and she'll be a safe partner for the next guy, but I wasn't willing to risk it. Bobby Lee nodded his head. I'm willing to risk it with her, and she's willing to risk it with me if you give your blessing. If you don't want to give me your blessing, I'll lend it right now before we get in too deep. Grant leaned back in his chair and exhaled deeply as he thought about Kat and Bobby Lee. How did he feel about his ex-wife free joining his family? He still loved her and she still loved him. You couldn't turn off 20 plus years of love like water from a spigot. Kat would always be a part of his story, and he a part of hers. But could they make the shift to friendship after all she had put him through? Could he forgive her? Could you let her find happiness with someone else, or did you want to hang on to his anger and watch her burn? Tell you what Bobby Lee, I think I'm okay with it. I may not have the same kind of relationship with her that I have with your sister, but I think I can eventually get part way there. As long as the two of you are good to each other and bring happiness to each other, I'll be a cheerleader for you. I do want my son's mother to have a good life and be in a good place mentally. You're a good friend and a good man, so maybe it would be good for both of you. So, good luck my friend. If you get married, invite me to the wedding. And he did. Setting the record straight. Civil trials are very tedious, so this one moved at a fast pace. Realism does suffer as a result. Kat didn't get completely torched in this story, but her husband and son are good guys and would not do that. But Coach King. Duck that guy. That's it for our two-part story, friends. I hope you enjoyed the twists and turns in this one. Don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.